All right, welcome to the podcast. We have on such an awesome guest today. This is video game writer, designer, John Gonzalez. John, thanks for being on with us. My pleasure, Jeffrey. John, you've worked on Horizon Zero Dawn, Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, and personally, my favorite, Fallout New Vegas. So exciting. I actually wanted to bring you on because uh, the Fallout games are pretty incredible. They're uh, immersive, they're sci-fi, post-apocalyptic, all that stuff, really fun to play. But the storylines are always memorable and they're always very open world and sandbox. Now, Fallout New Vegas is known as like arguably one of the best Fallout games. It's got a 10 out of 10 on Steam and it sits dearly in the hearts of gamers. So being able to get you on as lead writer on this game and talk about it is such a treat. Okay, great. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready, everybody. All right. So before we really roll into this, I always like to kind of get a little bit of your origin story. And then if you can kind of roll us into how you ended up being with, with Obsidian and working on this game. Yeah, sure. So I have an odd origin story because um, I really didn't prepare in any kind of conscious, uh, professionalizing kind of way okay. uh, to be in the video game industry. I got into the video game industry uh, through a combination of, of good luck and hard work back in the year 2000. So it was a very different industry at the time. Um, and I would say that most of it was good luck. Uh, so my background, uh, educationally, I did an English major, so I did study creative writing and, and literature. Um, and I had a dream since I was a very small kid um, to be a writer. I had absolutely no idea how to make that actually happen. Yeah. And I didn't understand, especially when I was a university student, that there, there actually is a kind of networking game to be played, even if you're going to be a novelist or a short story writer. So I thought that what you did is you wrote, you know, short stories and you sent them off to a magazine and then uh, someone realized that you must be brilliant and an amazing <laughs> talent and then your career would take off. And in my case, what would happen is I would write a short story and I would get rejected and then right. I would be crestfallen and not really know what to do. And uh, I wouldn't do anything for a year or so. And then my courage would kind of come back and I'd write another story and get rejected again. And I really had no idea how to go past that. So uh, I, I worked in an entirely different other uh, line of work, uh, okay. essentially human services and social work. So again, very unusual. Uh, most of my uh, professional background before the video game industry um, was spent with people who had severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar, were smoking crack, doing a bunch wow. of other hard drugs. I was what, the social worker who would show up, try to help out with services and that kind of thing. And despite all the jokes that usually people make, I would not say that was actually good preparation for the uh, for working with video game developers. I would say that they're quite different. Well, I would, I would, then, I would, I would argue though that it helped you really see facets of humanity that you I think that that's exactly the character. Right. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's exactly right, and I think that that's something that was really good about that kind of work as someone who is interested in creative writing is it required kind of extreme forms of empathy. I mean, empathy, right. not just on the level of co-feeling, of sympathetic feeling, yeah. but empathically trying to understand what the world looked like to somebody who was deeply paranoid, somebody who was hallucinating, somebody who was wow. incredibly, you know, really delusional. And that, when you sort of are putting yourself in that sort of other person's point of view, yeah. I mean, I suppose that that is, it ends up being good fodder for characterization later on if you're yeah. dealing with the portrayal of psychosis or something like that, but it also is it's just good practice in general. But after I got a graduate degree in social work and I got uh, employed, I was sort of on the track to being, you know, a, an administrator of an agency or something like that. And what I realized was I felt incredibly dissatisfied and, um, and actually and just frustrated. And I was reading this book written by Peter Biskind about Hollywood in the late 60s and the 70s called Easy Riders and Raging Bulls. Okay. I was reading about the creative careers of all of these heroes like you know, Scorsese and 
And and then also, you know, sort of how Hollywood changed, uh, you know, in the 70s with the advent of big blockbusters like Jaws and Star Wars. Right. And all of the people, all the movers and shakers who, who were involved in that. So I was reading about all these people who had these incredible creative careers, completely unlike the experience of life I was having. And it was driving me crazy. So I just started writing every single day. And then I'd been doing that for about eight months. I was working on stories and stuff like that. It was, it was really the first time in my life where I think I was really approaching writing in a very disciplined way. And then a friend of mine saw an ad for a video game writer position in the town where I live. This is the part that's just unbelievable. Wow, that's lot. amazing. Yeah, it was just crazy. So I, I was sort of primed and I read some writing samples for the application, sent it in, nothing happened for several months. Turned out that um, they had been swamped by out of like 300 um, of applications. And I was their second choice. I was not their first choice. Their first choice was a novelist who published, I think, three novels who decided that he didn't want to work on a team where people could be judging his writing and sort of directing his writing. <laughs> and of course, so which I can understand. I, I think that's a respectable concern to have, but, but it, it, it certainly opened the door for me because, of course, I was... To me, I was delighted by the idea of, yeah. of having people tell me what to do um, and just to have a shot. So I, I joined, that was a place called uh, Rage Games in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I joined in, I think it was March of 2000. Okay. I worked on two games. The first game was, uh, the first game was canceled. The second game was a total flop. And oh my gosh. In the, in the studio being closed. However. Well, I got to get the name of this flop. Come on. The name of the flop was Alter Echo, and it was a science fiction title set on a very strange, visually unique world. And what, what system was it going to come out for? Were they looking it, at? It launched on both the PlayStation Two and the uh, the original Xbox. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, I think that it, I think on both platforms it sold about sixty thousand copies, which is really bad. yeah. And 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 one time I was at an industry event many years later. And I was, I was asked to summarize my career and I said I'd worked on this. I worked on a game that none of you have ever heard of called <laughs> Ultra Echo. And, and one guy said, I played that. And I said, Oh, thanks for the sale. And he said, Oh, I didn't buy it. <laughs> um, he had just uh he had been somewhere where there was a copy, so he had played it. Uh, and that's literally the only time I've ever spoken to anyone who ever well, played the game. So it was a very in terms of sales, in terms of critical. Uh, reviews is a rather inauspicious start. I mean, it was a canceled project and a project yeah. that didn't that flop. But personally, it was it was like the best possible situation I could have ever chanced into because it was about three and a half years of being paid to learn what everyone on a team was doing in game development. It was like a paid internship wow. in game development where I was working directly with programmers, with designers, with artists. And I was the narrative lead on the very first project I ever worked on, which is also crazy. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. And that's, which has been the case throughout my entire career. I've actually never been in a, um, in a junior role on, uh, on any project that I've worked on. So that, see, I think that those are just things that, that's almost impossible. I don't know. I mean, it, to happen now. It's almost impossible to happen now. Well, I'm of the school that believes luck and luck and opportunity comes from hard work and perseverance. I really do. I think that you make your own luck by being available, by, you know, uh, sharpening that axe on the grindstone. Um, and then that's what you were doing. You were getting out there. And, and so you happened to find a gig locally, you know, but you still got that gig and worked hard to get it. Um, yeah, so, it, yeah. I think that it is, it, it absolutely requires, it, it does require both. And you're absolutely right that the more you put yourself out there, the more available you make yourself, the more chances at bat you're going to get. Yeah. But I, I think that, I think that, you know, the universe sort of smiled on me there. And, and yeah, there was been, there was a lot of work to get there, but there's been a lot of work since, but still. Right. I, I can't, I can't, I, you know, in, in many ways, the only advice I can offer someone is what just, just what you said is just put yourself out there, work hard, but put yourself out there, but just hope that you get lucky because that's, it requires that. So, so Obsidian uh, was made up of 
uh, creators that made the original couple of Fallout games, and then they they founded Obsidian and somehow worked out a deal with Bethesda, who owned the rights to Fallout, to make their own game. You were you were able to get on that, get that gig. You were able to get that gig, be lead uh, uh, lead writer for that gig. So, I mean, what was the plan? Did they know where they were going? Did they know it was going to be Vegas? I mean, give me the walkthrough. Yeah, sure. Okay, so just to catch things up for me, I had a I had another gig before this. I worked for Ubisoft in Shanghai in another game. Came back, wanted to get into more narratively focused uh, games like role playing games. Okay, I was very interested in Obsidian because that was their specialty. Like you said, it was founded by people who are part of Black Isle Games, which was a kind of internal studio for interplay back in the day. And that did include people who had worked on uh, earlier Fallout titles. Yeah. And one of the things that they had been working on before Black Isle was closed was the original Fallout 3. So okay. the original Fallout 3 was called Van Buren. Um, and I believe that Josh Sawyer, who was the project director of Fallout New Vegas, I think he was the lead designer, maybe even the project director of Van Buren. Okay. And, uh, and so they were working on that when... when Black Isle was closed. Then the license ended up being uh, purchased by Bethesda. And in, gosh, was that 2008 that they brought out Fallout 3? Which was, yeah, of course, that's about, that huge, sounds about right. Yeah. That's an absolutely huge, huge game, huge success. It was a game changer. Um, it was. It, it was. was. It I really think, was. I think, I think that Bethesda does deserve a lot credit for taking the world of fallout and experience and then you know sort of the isometric turn-based experience and seeing a way of transferring that over into the uh, first person oh it's it brilliant and and, and so you world experience so josh sawyer was the director of fallout new vegas right yes okay all right so then so then you worked with him you got on there so so van buren became uh, Fallout Three, and then you guys well, sort of different. Okay, because what sort of what happened is so Bethesda has this huge success with Fallout Three. Okay, but then what they have next on their docket is a game. It ends up being a little game called Skyrim. Right? That was known. <laughs> that was known at the time. But yeah, that's what they were working on next. Okay, and so what they wanted to do is Bethesda wanted to have the ability to bring out a new Fallout when they didn't have the internal resources to do that. Oh, that makes sense. And, yeah. And so what they did is they decided, let's figure out, it, it, they were already a publisher. They were already had, you know, publisher relationships with other studios. So they approached Obsidian and they said, hey, you guys have a history with this license, with this IP. Yeah. Would you like to do a Fallout game? And okay. I did hear, so I had joined Obsidian to work on a completely different game, an Aliens RPG, which I was excited about. I mean, I love the Aliens IP, um, but well, the first two movies. Um, and so uh, that got canceled about six weeks after I joined the company. Oh my and, gosh. And, and, and before that, I had heard these rumors. There were these sort of stirrings that, they, that the studio might be doing something that would be uh, for Fallout. And I thought, damn it, I wish I could be working on that because I just adore Fallout. Fallout was one of my, you know, favorite favorite uh, uh series so aliens got canceled and i was not laid off which i was surprised by because i was the newest kid in the studio and uh so the next morning i was writing up this email to fergus urquhart who's the ceo of obsidian and i was saying you know obviously i'll work on anything that you want me to work on but if there would be any chance that i might be able to work on fallout this fallout game i would really like that and, and well i would before i finished that email fergus came into my office and he said okay so you're the lead narrative guy on the new fallout and then he just turned and walked out of the office you hadn't even sent the email no and that's I, fantastic all it was was that josh had worked with me for a number of weeks on the aliens rpg felt like there was potential there I, I i wouldn't think that he could have thought oh this guy's amazing he'll do it i just think he thought I think that he he was he saw a promise in the performance that I had to that yeah, time. Yeah, that's great. So he wanted to see me in that role, and so I was I was like I was freaked out. I mean, I was overjoyed, but I was freaked out. Yeah, of course. Time. I mean, that's it's a huge gig. So who who pitched 
the um, New Vegas idea? So I think that New Vegas, the, the, the location was definitely, well, I shouldn't say definitely. My understanding is the location was chosen by uh, Obsidian. Okay. They wanted to bring Fallout back out to the West Coast. You know, Bethesda is an East Coast developer. They right. in Washington, D.C. Yeah. They ended up doing Boston in Fallout 4. Yeah. These guys wanted to bring it back out to the West Coast, okay. um, like the original uh, Fallouts. And then um, I think it was Chris Avalon who pitched this idea that the game would begin with you being shot in the head and left in a shallow grave. I kind love like, that um, idea. Yeah, you know, like a mob very much kind of like a Vegas mob story beginning. And then Josh Sawyer wanted to have the game climax with the battle for Hoover Dam between this faction of Caesar's Legion and, um, the and the new California. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then the rest of it was sort of, you know, figure this out. So you guys kind of beated it out right away. What I really liked about the intro of waking up in a grave, because the whole thing about fallout three was, you know, from birth, right? So the the training was you're a baby, you know, and that was like, your, that was the training situation. So I was really curious in New Vegas when I sat down to play, like, how are they going to top that? Because it is kind of cool to grow up from a baby to an adult. And, uh, and then getting shot in the head and being birthed out of the grave that way was brilliant. I thought it was a great follow-up to Fallout 3 and very Vegas-y, you know? So you guys absolutely nailed it. And then you... You go on that adventure and that journey. So in the in the designing of this game, of the narrative where you have the 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 peak at the Hoover Dam, that makes total sense. It's really cool. But where did things like, you know, Mr. House come from? I mean, stuff like that is fascinating. It really came from uh, a kind of phase of research that I did once I was on the project. I just started to read whatever I could about Vegas and also to watch a lot of films that were set in Vegas. And, okay. and, and interestingly enough, I had never been to Vegas and, and we didn't have a, a research trip budget. So I never got to Vegas until oh, after, no. <laughs> after the game. But um, so some of the things that were kind of um, seminal references that I encountered, I mean, one was definitely Bugsy Siegel, who's very much the right. inspiration for the Benny character. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of that, at least. I mean, like, actually, the check suit that Benny wears is a pretty much direct quote. Hold from, on. Uh, sorry, I, I have some traffic noise outside. <laughs> One second. Or maybe it's just some Benny fans where you know, hunting the hardest of us. But um, Benny, yeah, the, who was voiced by Matthew Perry, by the way. Yeah, which is it's definitely I think like kind of casting against type. Yeah. But um, but he really wanted to be. We were really fortunate that Matthew Perry had played fallout 3 and had adored it and he really wanted to be involved in the next oh, okay. fallout that's cool so we you know so he, he sort of volunteered and took a big pay cut in order to uh and we definitely did not pay him what he would have gotten for a friend's reunion uh oh, to be in fallout in fallout uh new vegas so that inspired uh benny and then the other thing that inspired benny was really the whole rat pack kind okay. of sorry rat pack not rat, rat, pack. rat pack yeah I, I'm, I'm dating myself. I grew up with the Brad. The Brad Pack in the '80s. Yeah. yeah. No. No. Yeah. yeah. This is the Brad. <laughs> and 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 this kind of very specific kind of cool that they had, and this right. very interesting patois that they had, and then and like it, you really get this in the original um, Ocean's Eleven, for example. Yeah. Just some amazing suit. examples. The suits and the swagger. Yes. Yeah, so there was a lot of a lot of that, and that that ended up also inspiring the. Uh, one of the three tribes on the strip, the chairman, who have the casino called the Tops. That was the, tops, the, the rat, yes. that's the Rat Pack, kind of glory days of Vegas, cool and yeah, exactly. And you guys, but you guys had uh, you had a uh, a band at the Tops, and it was called uh, the Rad Pack, right? Yeah, was, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, things like that that are really cool. Yeah, yeah it became like. You could kind of see a lot of ways of having little, little nods like that, little puns like that. Um, yeah. And then another thing, so Mr. House really came from the the sort of involvement that Howard Hughes had with the uh, with Vegas, which is a very, I mean, it's, it is really fascinating stuff. And so, of course, it, it changed somewhat. I mean. It, 
Howard Hughes is, is, you know, Mr. House is much more of kind of a, I mean, a somewhat paranoid, like fundamentally paranoid, right. but more, right. he, he actually kind of more closely conforms with a, a sort of Silicon Valley technology libertarians that we see nowadays. So that idea of a, of a mastermind um, who was vying to exploit this coming conflict between right. um, between the NCR and Caesar's Legion, I thought was was really interesting. Well, it's all about um, power. It's all about power and control, right? I mean, if he's like a like a, a like a Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes had severe OCD, and OCD is, is one of those things. But one of the tenets of OCD is control. They have to control every little thing. That's why they wash their hands forty times and all these different things, or you know. Uh, pee in a jar you know i mean you can, it's just these weird things yeah. and and that's what mr house was is he was exploiting each faction so that he was running the show um and it's just it's brilliant writing and i think he was voiced by Aber Rene Aber Rene Aber yeah. yeah from it was amazing Oh yeah, so good. And he played Odo in um, Deep Space Nine, one of my favorites. And so uh, it's it's just great. I I, I love the whole thing um, behind Mr. House and, and and that whole statement that you're making. Now, one of one of my favorite plot lines was the Ultra Lux Hotel. Yes, the White Glove Society. The White Glove Society. I thought was brilliant right because you go in there and and they're living this rich elegant lifestyle and they're eating all this great food and as soon as you walk in you're going all right none of this is right we're in the apocalypse right and so then you guys came up with this brilliant idea of the fact that they're eating people and then of ways that you could expose that or not i just where did you where did this come to come up with because i thought it was great i thought it was well well before it's time as far as writing goes because i'm seeing films now coming out that are you know post-apocalyptic and they're in hotels and they're eating people and that's the big surprise and i'm like i played this 10 years ago so what uh like tell me the inspiration for that because i think it's just brilliant yeah so the inspiration for that was during the same phase where i was doing a lot of reading and, and just contemplating vegas and um and and i remember that my um white gloves the white glove society was a a different and i think you know better Name for it given by Eric Fenstermaker, who ended up actually writing that content. Okay. Um, and in my version, it was called the, they were called the debutantes. Okay. And um, and they didn't have the the creepy kind of eyes wide shut masks that came later too. <laughs> yeah, that they, worked they were, as well. <laughs> yeah, it worked very well. But you know, in my version, uh, the kind of initial draft, they were just sort of you know dapper and and, and you know super suave and um, and and all about luxury and the finer things in life and glamour. Right. But but for me it was the it was to have a casino that directly embodied the 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 sort of like the the surface glamour of Vegas yeah and the underlying predation of the city the way that it is there to sort of take in losers part them from their money and send them back home you know and if they're lucky they go away feeling like they were a king or a queen for a weekend yeah and if they're unlucky their lives are destroyed you know they're just eaten up and chewed up and and spit out and and so i think it was um in that sense they they sort of began as a kind of metaphorical expression yeah. of that aspect of vegas and then when fenster maker took over that quest line he added a lot of intrigue and complexity to it and this is one of the things you really had to do when you were working on a quest for Fallout New Vegas is you had to think, okay, how, how do I make this work so that it can be completed in a lot of different ways? Oh, yeah. had, every, everything had to be something that you could complete if you were playing as a walking flamethrower who killed everybody the moment that you met them, you know, just like the most depraved murderer imaginable <laughs> if you're playing that way, or if you were playing as an ultimate pacifist yeah. It wouldn't even kill, you know, an animal throughout yeah. the game. And, and that was, those are difficult parameters to, you know, to fit. And so that's why, you know, the, the quest would have ways that you could use speech skills, diplomacy, investigation to solve them, as well as using a lot of violence, uh, which 
still remained kind of my favorite way. But well, I, I, I have to tell you, I mean, because you guys achieved it. I mean, there are YouTubers out there who went through and, and figured out how to break Fallout New Vegas, or not not yours, but how to break Fallout Three. And they would go through and they would they would assassinate certain key members, and then that would break whatever narration they had, and then you would get soft locked in the game. Yeah. So just to say a bit about that, like we had to be everything had to be written and designed for the possibility that you would kill a character as soon as you could. And so what that meant was yeah. like evidence, you know, or, or like clues to continue the quest might have to be in the form of a journal entry that they had on the corpse that you could find. So you could keep going. And that was the inspiration for Yes Man is I was trying to think, how is it that I can make sure that the main quest of the game is something that you can complete even if you kill Caesar and piss off right. Legion, even if right. you, you, you alienate everyone. And so that was the inspiration for this idea. Like, well, what if you have an AI that you can destroy any instantiation, but then it comes back and because it's pathologically, um, you know, sort of a, a pathologically, uh, what is the word for when some a sycophant, a sycophant. Oh, like yeah. Other, yeah, yeah, he's good with AI it. This like, it's, yeah, he just, yeah, I'm sorry, it was me, it's my <laughs> fault. Yeah, just accepts any amount of abuse. And that was just to make sure that it could proof the main quest uh, for the, the total sociopath. Well, it's, it's, it absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant because I, I'm not going to say I didn't have a playthrough where I was a walking flamethrower. Totally did. I mean, there was a point where I went through and I was just like, I wanted to see if I could break the game. I went in, I took out Caesar, which took like 64 resaves before I could get it done. <laughs> I finally did it. And, and and like, no, the game kept going. I was like, it's absolutely amazing that you guys are able to do that. You can go through and burn every single uh, casino and everything just fine keeps playing out. I mean, it's it's really is a testament of why this game is so good because you can play it so many different ways and hit so many different narratives and see things that you never thought were there before. Um, and this game is a decade old and it holds up it's absolutely fantastic. Well, that's right. That's super kind of you to say. I really think that it's a testament to uh, like essentially Obsidian's depth of skill in creating that kind of experience. Yeah. I mean, that was the first role playing game that I ever worked on. And I was working with people who were experts in that. And, and I mean, I learned so much from working with Josh Sawyer, I think, in particular, because he was the person who really laid out a lot of the kind of vision for the Mojave wasteland right. that he wanted to have in the game. He had been, he had actually been game mastering people through campaigns set in the Fallout universe in the Mojave during the period of time that he wasn't working on the digital games. And he, he was a, 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 a fan in great depth. Of do you, I mean, do you think he was project. kind of testing out like uh, campaigns? Was he, te was he testing out storylines? I think that there, well, there were certainly characters. Okay. I mean, the, the, uh, the companion arcade Ganon, I believe his last name is. Yeah. Um, I think that if I recall correctly, that was a character that Josh had had in a fallout game. Uh, and, performed by Zachary Levi. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Very capably. And I think that also, um, I mean, there were some elements that came, I don't know if, if Josh had played around with them in tabletop RPGs, but I, from Van Buren. So like an element yeah. from Van Buren. Van Buren had a lot of stuff, but most okay. of which didn't show up in New Vegas. But one thing that was there in Van Buren was Caesar's Legion, that idea. Okay. And then, but then, I mean, that, changed tremendously i would say that there's there's actually not a whole lot about the caesar in fallout new vegas that really resembles what had been written previously but it was still I, that was I, the inspiration I, for it i thought it was great you know because when you play fallout three you're thinking okay you're gonna have these weird you know punk steampunk weird savages coming at you with crazy mohawks entire armor right and then you're walking around new vegas and you're like that looks like a roman legion <laughs> you're like okay we're in a whole different world now i thought it was great because it's definitely a, a totally different and new approach to taking on a a type of villain that you had and you had them and and, and i think there's a there's a commentary and conformity there i mean there's so much commentary like political commentary or even social commentary can be done through science fiction and um and it's a great 
uh, way to do that. And you guys do that in, in New Vegas in a way that is just like if you can, if you can look at it, you can really step back and appreciate the amount of depth you guys have for this game. One of my favorite memories um, from the development of New Vegas, it, I mean, it might have been, it was probably the first week that we were working on the game, um, is we had some designers who assembled in the conference room. And Josh Sawyer walked in and he said, okay, so we're not going to do good and evil. We're going to do lots and lots of ambiguity, lots and lots of moral ambiguity. Everything's going to be gray. And one of the things that, um, I mean, I was really, really excited by that because what it, what it was, is it was a, not just an invitation, but a charge to explore these different factions in tremendous depth. So what I, what I had to do, for example, when writing Caesar's Legion is I tried to had to think, and this wasn't, it's not this, this wasn't comfortable. <laughs> but I had to think like, what are the most compelling arguments I can come up with for fascism? Yeah. You know, for military dictatorship. Like right. how and, and what is the psycho like what's the best argument that this guy can make for what he's doing? And then how do we also layer in enough depth enough depth to make you wonder, okay, well, maybe he's right. He gotta, yeah. Has he got a point or is yeah. this some kind or is he just justifying his own psychological issues? You know, like is yeah. he just and 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 this is one of the reasons why the NCR, for example, like the NCR, they're kind of like the guys that automatically you would think, well, they're the good guys because they feel very familiar if you're like, right. You know, they feel the like rebels. Or, yeah. But instead, what you you realize is like, well, actually, they're they're quite corrupt. I mean, there are a lot of good things about them, but there are also yeah. a lot of bad things. And they're there for a land grab to basically seize all this territory from the people who are already there. Yeah. And then you've got Mr. House and he's like, oh, he's brilliant. And and it might actually be that he can literally make all of his ambitions come true. But yeah. there's also something very sinister and controlling about this. Oh, guy. very so, much so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we were trying to, we were trying to make sure that every faction and character that you spent time with would get would really get you thinking and and sort yeah, of it really did. ask you questions like, what do you what do you think of these of these folks and these factions and what do you want to do in this environment and that has had a huge impact on my i guess you'd say world building throughout my career i mean when i was working on uh on horizon for example the way that i approached um, the imagining the world and the tribes and all that kind yeah. of stuff was very much influenced by uh, what I had learned, you know, uh, at Obsidian. Well, I can tell you playing the, playing these games, playing New Vegas, um, if you're doing it the right way, if you're playing honestly, if you're not just going, I'm just going to shoot everybody, if you're not going to play that way, if you're going to play in a way where, you know, you're trying to be like you, but and how you would respond to things, uh, you learn about you. I'll tell you that much. You learn about who you are. You learn and you learn about your moral spectrum. Uh, and and it's really fascinating. I mean, I remember uh, playing the game and then Mr. House is like, I'm going to give you this nice this nice room to live in. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this. Maybe I might ignore some of the atrocities going on in New Vegas. But then when I go into like the Lux and I see they're eating people's like, well, no, now I've got to, I've got to shut this down. You know, like you learn a lot about uh, 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 who you are as a person. And I think that takes, there's, that's a credit to how much work and effort you guys have put into the, into that game. I think it's also something that's uh, in a way kind of specific to that kind of, of player driven narrative experience where especially if it's played in first person because when you're playing it in first person I and mean, then like for example if you're playing yeah. a third person action adventure or action rpg game like horizon or the last of us or or yeah. even an rpg like the witcher you have an, uh, some distance between you and that character right i right. mean like like you're not really gerald or you're not really joel you're not really aloy you're you're the player who's controlling them and you have an empathic connection to the character more like you would in a film yeah, but in a game true. like fallout where you step or skyrim you know, these open world first person games you step into a player shaped hole and right. it really is it's just like who do you want to be now who are you going to be yeah you're not you're not empathizing with the player character because you are the player character 
Yeah. You're identifying. You're 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 fused with that position in the world. And so yeah, I think it 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 sort of you're making decisions on the basis of what you want to do and how it makes you feel, not on the basis of how you think a character might feel or what a character might want to do. I mean, it's very true. I mean, I remember doing a playthrough where I was like, I'm purposely going to play the bad guy. I'm going to do horrible things um, just just because I wanted to see what the what would happen with the game. And I hit a point where I found a, a, a stable of slaves um, and I was like, I can't. I'm not OK with this <laughs> I went through, now of course, I freed all of the slaves and, and then uh, went through and, and, and destroyed all of the owners. You know, I was like, but that's not me being a bad guy. Um, but I just, you hit that wall. that And it was like, I was shocked to run into that as a gamer and that it would elicit that kind of a response in me. I mean, it's just great. So um, with the different casinos, we had the Ultra Lux. We talked about the Lucky 38th and Tops. There's also Gamora, which yes. is more of like the seedier casino. Right. Yeah. And it seems like with all of these different casinos, you're kind of representing really different facets of of humanity. I mean, that's what I was taking out of it. Different facets of humanity and different facets of Vegas. I mean, this is okay. in, in a way, this is the experience of walking down you know, the strip and having somebody hand you uh, flyers for call girls every 15 feet. Yes. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of humanity for sale and there's a lot of vice for sale in city that's part of its well it's i guess it's you know a part of its allure for many people and like what happens in vegas stays in vegas as as the saying goes yeah and so uh, but this is also the as you say the seedy underbelly of vegas controlled uh i mean of mob controlled vegas you know that you see in the, the 60s and 70s i guess maybe into the 80s um, I'm a little bit hazy on some of the, on the research now, uh, but you know this is the stuff you kind of see, you know, in a way like in casino or something like that. Right, you know, somebody's right. going to get their head crushed in a vice, you know, and and there are a lot of bodies that are tied up and a lot of violence. And so yeah, the the Amertas, I believe, were the 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 tribe there, and right. they 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 very much embodied that aspect. So I want to talk to you about the companions real quick. Cause I thought the companions in Fallout New Vegas are really cool. I mean, you had you had Raul, who was voiced by uh, Danny Trejo, who was a ghoul, um, which you know, great character. Um, you had a couple of robots. You had the uh, Fallout's known for having their dog companions, and so you made one uh, cybernetic, which was really cool. Um, can't remember his name. Yeah, I can't remember. Either. I think it might have been Canine something or whatever. Yeah. I remember it was okay. it was like Eddie. Eddie was the robot. Eddie was the iBot. Yeah, the iBot. I I loved the iBot. Yeah, I don't actually remember the name of the dog either. And I remember that you had to, there was the quest to get it a new brain. Uh, But I don't, I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember the, uh, the name. So when you were designing the companions, did you have specific types of companions or demographics that you're aiming for? Yeah, I think that the, from what I recall, the companions were actually I think they were more pitched by Josh. They might have okay. even been pitched by some of the other, uh, by some of the other writers. My my duties on the game were much more the the kind of the main quest and other side quests that were gotcha. you know related to the strip. I didn't write any of the companions. Okay. So the arcade Ganon um, was written by Josh Sawyer. Um, both Raul Tejeda and Lily Bowen, I think, was the name of the super mutant or the right. Nightkin. Yeah, both of those were written by Travis Stout. Okay. Eric Fenstermaker wrote Craig Boone and Veronica, the okay. um, the scribe um, for the of the Legion of Steel. Do yeah, I remember that correctly? Brotherhood. Yeah, um, Brotherhood. Jesus. Um, like I said, it's been a while. That's all um, right. But uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's only been a decade. You can't have a hazy. <laughs> you can't have a hazy recall after a decade. Of course, totally. I get yeah. it. But with yeah. with with the uh, with the companions, um, I thought they were really interesting because you guys went in a different direction. It wasn't just basic; uh, they're going to follow you along. I mean, you had some companions that had a lot of uh, heart to them, and and you could become attached to them and favor them. Uh, of course, I was stuck on Eddie just because I thought it was cool to have an iBot. Uh, so I just had an iBot fl- follow me around. I thought it was pretty awesome. Um, now, did you guys know? that this game was going to be so well received. 
Well, no, I don't think we knew that. And I think that actually that it wasn't as well received when it first came out. I mean, when it first came out, it, the Metacritic on famously or infamously, the Metacritic on PlayStation and Xbox platforms was 84, because apparently at 85, the studio would have received a $1 million bonus from Bethesda. Um, and, and the reviews were, were very positive, but the, the title was plagued by bugs um, and, and really slammed for that. And I don't know why it is that the game was especially slammed for that because, you know, this is something that I think a lot of the time Obsidian people have, have felt was that like, well, the Bethesda games came out and they were, were full of bugs too, but they oh, seemed yeah. to not get. So I think that they, there was a feeling that that wasn't entirely fair. I think that it's a game that in some ways has uh, the, you know, as the, as the bugs were fixed and as the experiences are fine a little bit, I think that the estimation of it has, if anything, increased over time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it has a perfect 10 on Steam. That's not easy to do. And gamers think of it fondly. You can go on Reddit threads. You can go on Reddit threads. You could rabbit hole down Reddit and find people that will will die in a hell saying that Fallout New Vegas is the best Fallout game. Um, it has aged well, sir, like a fine wine. Um, it is very replayable. It's easy to go back to. Is there any kind of behind the scenes stories that uh, that you could give any of the gamers out there that are listening to this? Behind the scenes Any hijinks? I mean, I actually remember this as being a very low drama development experience. I mean, I, I guess that what you, what I would say is that the, it was the most intense crunch that I ever worked in my career. How long did it take? Um, well, we had 18 months to make it, which Trump. is not a lot of time. Wow. And I mean, we were starting off with the, the tools and the engine that Bethesda right. had already yeah. used. So of that, course. that was a huge help, but. Um, it was, for me, it was seven days a week and often, you know, 10, 12 hour days for a long time to get it, to get that done. Um, and I think that there were a lot of other people who were also working very long hours. Um, but I don't think, I mean, so, I, but I don't think there was any kind of like great drama. I no mean, drama was, in the set. All right. No, I, I thought I, I could get a little something out of you. No, in particular, I mean, I Sorry. had very high especially high opinion of, of the work that I had with, with Josh Sawyer. I mean, I thought that Josh, I just could not have asked for a better project director and also somebody to learn that kind of narrative design craft from. Okay. And I think also that the, the quest designers, because the people who are working, uh, who work at Obsidian, the model they have there is that you both um, implement the quest and do the writing for the quest. That's, that's very commonly the case. Okay. And so the other people who are credited with writing and the people I've just name checked uh, who are involved in quests and, and in uh, companion writing, they did a, they did an amazing job there. And so, yeah. Um, no, that, a lot that's of, a good a lot work. work. That, that's a good work environment. So seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day for a year and a half straight. It's amazing that you were able to, Keep it together, sir, because that could not be easy. Just because I'm speaking from experience, I understand how much work that is. And it takes yeah. a very special uh, person to be able to get through it and not burn out. Now, what do you have going on right now? Do you have anything coming up? Are you taking a break? So, um, the, so one, so Horizon 2, uh, The Forbidden West. Okay. We'll be releasing in 2021. Um, I worked on that until I think it was probably around April or May of 2020, like after COVID had started. Okay. Um, and and so that's the sequel of Horizon Zero Dawn. So I, I developed the story for that and wrote uh, a lot of the the main quest content before I left uh, Gorilla. Okay. Um, so that's going to be that's. I think Gorilla is still hard at work on that title. That'll be coming out sometime in 2021. I will be as excited to play it as, uh, as anyone out there, I think. And then uh, currently I'm working for a new studio that um, Smilegate, which is a, a huge uh, Korean video Hold game on. developer. We, we got an emergency. Hold on. There we go. Okay. You had an ambulance going by. Oh, right. sorry. Go ahead. Nope. It's back. You must be on a main street. Yeah, yeah, so I'm on uh, Main Street in Barcelona. So One sec. We'll let the, the ambulance go by. 
Okay. Go ahead. So I, I, I talked about the horizon and then I'll talk. So and now, um, so and now I'm working with uh, Smilegate Barcelona. It's a studio that was started in Barcelona by a, a huge uh, Korean video game company called Smilegate. They're uh, they have the the kind of the most successful uh, multiplayer first person shooter in Asia, but aren't really known in the West. Ah, um, okay. And so Smilegate is is making um, its efforts to start to raise its profile in the in the West. And so that involves starting a, a triple A open world studio in my favorite city in the world, Barcelona, Spain. Um, and so when I found out about that and found out more about the team of folks who'd be working on and the fact that it was an opportunity to, to essentially start a new IP from zero wow. um, and just That's imagine it from the ground up, I, I was, uh, I, my, my attention was captured. So I've been working, um, working with them since, I think, since last, uh, well, since I, I left um, Gorilla and um, have been here in Barcelona since October. Things, you know, were weird during this whole, they've been very weird for everyone, obviously. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, that- so, Yeah, I can't, I can't say anything about no, it. No, that's that, fine. Except that it's an open world, it's an open world uh, game that I'm super, super excited about. Well, congratulations on that. And when this is ready to take off and launch, reach out and I'd love to have you on the show. Oh, that would be my, it'd be very much, uh, I'd love to do that. It'd yeah, we could, we, could dis- we could discuss it. I'd be super excited about it. Well, thank you so much for all of your, your knowledge and, and, and uh, on Fallout New Vegas. It's always great to kind of get behind, behind the scenes on projects like this and to learn about your passion and your process is, is absolutely fantastic. So really appreciate you being on, John. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's been a lot of fun to have a chance to reminisce a little bit about the game and think about the folks that uh, were involved in making it Obsidian. Um, it was, I mean, obviously a hugely important project and period of time in my life. So it's, it's always a pleasure to revisit it. Thank you. Absolutely.